Well, good morning, church. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you. Scott, Danielle, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Scott, will you pray for God's blessing in this morning's study? Certainly. Lord, we want to pray that you um, send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, to um, value our brethren, and to realize that whenever we do some um, good work, it's for you, Jesus. And when we do it to one of the least people, anyone who's been in difficulty, help us to be uh, humble and helpful to our brethren and to uh, all, all humanity who is in suffering and need, which encompasses a, a large number of people. Um, so thank you, Lord, for this privilege of studying your word together. And we ask for your blessing and your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 The, uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you. I appreciate thank you. that a lot. The memory text or the key text for this uh, week's Sabbath School lesson comes from Matthew 25, and as you know, Matthew 25 is an incredible chapter, 24, 25 incredible chapters in the book of Matthew. And verse 34 tells us in Matthew 25, then the king will say to those on his right hand. Now, who's at the right hand of God when he makes this pronouncement? The sheep. Who's on his left? The goats. So you've got goats and sheep. So he turns to the people on his right, the sheep, and he says, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I really desire to be a sheep for God, a willing person that is willing to do his will, and I hope that you do the same. As a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson, um, I want to concentrate on, a, on a, a few things. I'm really going to paint a picture without really going into detail of this week's Sabbath School lesson. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, God wanted to bless his people in order that there would be no poor among them. And if we read Deuteronomy chapter 15, 3 and 4, here's what Scripture tells us. Verse 3, But you shall give your claim to what is owed to your brother, except when there may be no poor among you. This is verse 4. For the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an, as an inheritance. I want you to pay attention that what verse 3 says is if anybody owes you something and gives you what he owes, share it with the poor. That's remarkable. Unfortunately, however, due to our rejection of God and due to our unfaithfulness to God, po poverty will always exist. As the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and Matthew chapter 26. Because poverty exists in the world, our Savior's mission while on earth included spiritual and material relief for those who suffered financially. And as we uh, read in the Gospels, and we're going to read in Luke, and that's really part of Sunday's lesson, which Danielle will handle. Loving others and helping others in need is a divine commandment for those who follow the Savior. God told us in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 11, For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I commend you, saying, Remember, the Lord says, I commend you. I commend you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. This is a divine commandment. In Israel, as we study in Mon Monday's lesson and Dr. Scott will, will end on Monday's lesson. Welfare work was a collective and individual duty. This is seen in the practice every seven years of allowing the land to rest. This is also seen in the gathering of gleaning from the harvest. 
and in the right of the hungry to feed from someone else's field. The scripture, as we read in Isaiah chapter 58 and Job chapter 29, teaches us to be proactive in charity. And I think you will touch on Thursday, you will touch on that on Thursday. So, as the Apostle James tells us in James 1.27, being proactive in charity is how we should live. It is part of a pure and undefiled religion that God expects you and I to have. Both the psalmist and the author of Proverbs in Psalms 41 and Proverbs 28 make it quite clear that when we take care of and love the vulnerable, we will receive divine blessings. Matthew chapter 25 clearly tells us that when we help the afflicted, we also help the Lord in the person of those in need. This passage of Scripture tells us that the separation and judgment, and by the way, the memory verse is part of that, the separation between sheep and goats is based on how Christ's followers treat the least and the marginal while they wait for Jesus' return. So, in this week's Sabbath school lesson, we, we study how Job was righteous because he loved the poor and helped them as if they were part of his family. We see how the apostles forsook all they had to follow the Savior. And in contrast, we see how the rich young ruler gave up the prospect of discipleship, refusing to donate his possessions to the poor because his love for his wealth was supreme. Just as being faithful in tithes and offerings is an indication of our love and relationship with God, as we read in Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 to 10, helping the weak and the poor among us brings us to an authentic spiritual experience with God and our fellow man, sim, uh, our, our fellow man which is very similar to the experience Zacchaeus had at his conversion, as we will study on Wednesday, as Danielle will handle it. That's a little brief interview to this week's lesson. So, Danielle, the life and ministry of Jesus. Talk to us about the life and ministry of Jesus. So, I love this lesson on my, that was assigned to me on Sunday because it really puts what belongs to God where it belongs to God. Amen. Mm -hmm. He really is the one that gave us this commission. And really interestingly, you know, we know beginning of his ministry that first he was baptized. Mm -hmm. And then we know that the, I think he, one of the first miracles was the Cana Galilee. But we see him very early in his ministry going to Nazareth and going to the synagogue as he had accustomed to, as the way he was raised up, going to the synagogue and so on and so forth. And he is invited, even though he's not the rabbi or he doesn't have any official position, but people have heard about him. As he was coming uh, to the area, they have heard already about him and his conversion and even miracles. So here he comes up and he is invited to speak. He's actually handed the scroll of Isaiah. And as he's handing the scroll of Isaiah, he picks to read in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. And we're going to look actually in Luke, where it's the story of how he came about and he, how he quoted that. And what do you be, believe? He talks about what the purpose of his ministry here is on earth. If somebody asked us why God, Jesus came to the earth, we say, well, to save us, die on the cross. That's not what he spoke about. That's not what he quoted about. So let's read it together. Luke 4, 16, 22. So here, the beginning of the story. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found 
the place where it was written. So it wasn't that that's the place he was pointed. That's the place he found to read. And it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is a quote. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable ear of the Lord. So here he goes, he is basically starting. He's been anointed to preach the gospel to who? The poor, the brokenhearted. Liberty to the captives, well, that would be all of us, captives to sin, and sight to the blind and those oppressed. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, that's why I'm here. That's what I've come to do. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Now, interesting things he's, he wrote about in here that he's, he if we were putting ourselves in the shoes of the local audience at that time, even though this is a text that they were familiar with because it was in the scrolls of Isaiah, they were not familiar with the concept anymore. It was something lost long before to them. Even now in Deuteronomy, they were told how to handle the poor and how to provide for the widows. They have lost it. To them now, the poor was, was someone that was str stricken by God that was subject, you know, they were getting what they were deserving. Those that were oppressed and they were in uh, difficult situations or losses and so on and so forth, they, they looked upon them, they looked down upon them. But Jesus said, that's who I came for here. So Jesus' love for the poor was one of the greatest evidences that he was the Messiah because it wasn't customary anymore to this world, but this was the prophecy of Isaiah was about the Messiah. And his work that pro proceeded after the reading of this text, which we are so familiar with, fulfilled. Now, we know there was another time when even someone that was so in tune with God as John the Baptist was also lost on this. This concept had already been lost on him as well. He had been so affected by the the society that he lived in, that when he st Jesus was doing the ministry and John the Baptist was in prison, he started doubting the Lord. And he sent people to, to talk to the Lord and ask him, are you the one we're expecting or is there another? So let's look together at this story in Matthew 11, 1 to 6. And here's John the Baptist. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. And he literally had the two disciples of John watch all day what he was doing. And then he commanded them to say, to go, to tell to him, to go back to John and to tell him, The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. It wasn't anymore, and we know that John believed because it's, he had lost the concept. But Jesus powerfully reminded him through action that that's what he had come to fulfill. So we know that he fulfilled exactly the commission of the Messiah. You know, and if we were doubting at all, we are given also a, a text in James 1.27 where it's told to us that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So it's more clear than that. It couldn't have been such a powerful commission. Now, even Jesus said, and he defined who the poor are, in Matthew 25, 31 to 40, if we were wondering, here it goes. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, in other words, at the second coming, then he, capital H, in other words, Jesus, will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, in other words, before Jesus, 
and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. You quoted that. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And that's the title of our lesson. But what exactly do they mean, the least of these? What? So we'll go back to his list, and I'm going to summarize it very quickly. So the, the list of these mean those who suffer, those who are incapable of providing for their material needs and thus were unable to live a dignified life because of social rejection or prejudice, prisoners, lepers, foreigners, for example. Those B, those who suffered extreme economic deprivation because of adverse condition like the poor, diseased, hungry, thirsty, naked, needy, and wretched. Those with physical constraints, the mute, the blind, the lame. Uh, those who were emotionally discouraged and maybe even psychologically uh, unable to care for themselves without assistance, like the broken hearty, the mentally ill, and the perishing. Victims of their own mistakes. Oppression and injustice, exiles, prisoners, victims of in in inequity, brutality, and exploitation. Those who needed help to start their lives anew. And basically, very interesting, the circumstances of poverty and the question of whether the sufferer is responsible for his or her uh, impoverished state are irrelevant. Nowhere does Jesus say to evaluate if there were the reason for their misfortune. Not at all. It's just beautiful. And the other thing that we see is that Jesus said very clearly what the guideline was. In John 3.16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's really the only. And if we, just in case we were wondering if the enemy, our enemies were included in that, we have Proverbs 25, 21 to 22, and Romans, which I will close with that. Here it says, in Proverbs 25, verses 21 to 22, it says, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And then it's repeated in Romans chapter 12, 20, 21. The same exact wording. It's practically a quote. So if we were wondering if our enemies qualify as needy, they do. Thanks so much, Danielle. It's quite, um, quite evident that Jesus' life and ministry reflected a pure and undefiled religion. Dr. Scott, God made provisions for the poor. Describe what scripture says about the type of provisions he made. Well, God said quite a lot about, um, about the poor. So in, uh, in the writings, uh, the Bible's authors, which included many of God's uh, provisions for the poor, the strange, the strangers, the widows, and the fatherless. Um, we have records of this going all the way back to Mount Sinai. Six years shall you sow your land and gather in its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and olive grove. Now there, there was um, a friend of the family who we used to have these discussion, and he, his point was that because we don't follow this biblical advice in the year of Jubilee as well, his belief was that recessions occur about every seven years and there's a major depression about every 50 years or so. 
So he thought that the economic cycle of boom and bust is kind of uh, what happens in the absence of God being um, people following God's advice. But I, my other point is that I think um, every seventh year, taking a year off to devote to, you know, to helping the poor, to preaching the gospel, to uh, spending more time with family, it would seem like a good good idea even in today's economy, but it seems difficult for most people to survive financially every seventh year. But uh, my thought is, could it be that maybe God would want us to do this even now? Um, so the other part that I found interesting here, let, let's read Leviticus 23, 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner residing among you. Um, and then it also says, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Mm -hmm. And and I would venture to say that it also applied to the people who are not Israelites. Um, and I think we have good examples for Jesus. He fed 5,000, those were the Israelites, but he also fed 4,000 that were non-Israelites. Um, but um, a little bit later on, the lesson talks about the teachings of social Darwinism. And I think we'll, we'll pause for a second here to, to talk a little bit about social Darwinism and kind of the modern perspective, which I think is a, a mistaken one. Um, so, oh, and, and this, I'll also introduce another interesting tool. So uh, my brother showed me an interesting tool. Have you heard of chat GPT? Anyway, it's an artificial intelligence source that can access any written book in the English language that's ever been published. So you can ask it to do logical tasks based on literary tasks. So I asked it to compare and contrast the teachings of the Bible and so social Darwinism as far as um, the care of the poor. So here, here's what it came up with saying, Social Darwinism and the Bible uh, have fundamentally different views on human natures and how societies should be organized. Social Darwinism is a belief that emerged in the late 19th century which attempted to apply Darwin's theory of evolution to human society. According to this ideology, one of the strongest, uh, only the strongest individuals and societies survive and the weak should be left to perish. And by the way, there's this other guy named Thomas Malthus who essentially said, if you feed the uh, starving, they'll just uh, have more babies and they'll still be starving. So basically he was saying, just let them starve. Uh, but I don't think that's what the Bible would say. The Bible, on the other hand, presents a very different view of humanity and our responsibility to one another. In terms of human nature, social Darwinism views people as fundamentally competitive and self-interested. This per perspective sees a society as a struggle for uh, survival in which the fittest and most successful individual or groups will prosper while the weak and disadvantaged will fail. By contrast, the Bible teaches that humans are created in the image of God and endowed with inherent dignity and worth. This perspective emphasizes our interconnectedness and the importance of caring for the vulnerable members of our society. So I'll, I'll stop there with that one. Um, but then I, I, I also got to thinking that there's an even more subtle deception that um, has crept in. And it's crept in from a very long time ago, which is the teachings of um, social justice of Catholicism which we originally find in St. Thomas Aquinas uh, back in about 500 AD, uh, so clearly a long time ago. And he had many good things to say, and if you compare it to social Darwinism, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas did a lot better. However, there's one subtle difference between, um, between what the Bible says and what St. Thomas Aquinas is, but I'll, I'll refer back to this contrast. Th this is the contrast that the, uh, that the computer came up with between St. Thomas 
Aquinas and the Old Testament version. And, and I think it was rather insightful, so I'll, I'll quote from it. When looking at the biblical view versus social Darwinism, it might appear that both views of St. Thomas Aquinas are more in line with the Bible than social Darwinism. Oh, here, here um, that was, I was repeating myself. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas believed in the principle of distributive justice, which means that resources should be distributed fairly so that everyone can have access to what they need. He believed that the rich have a duty to provide for the poor and that the state has a responsibility to ensure that the basic needs of all its citizens are met. This is based on the belief in common good, which emphasizes the importance of social cohesion and the welfare of members of all society. It kind of sounds good, but there's that subtle twist, which is um, the sort of top-down imposition of, um, of, of helping the poor. In contrast, the Old Testament places greater emphasis on individual acts of charity and compassion towards the poor. The book of Proverbs, for example, emphasizes the importance of giving to the poor as a way of honoring God. The Old Testament also contains numerous passages that call for protection of the widows and orphans and foreigners who are among the most vulnerable members of society. And then I also went into Ellen White, kind of what, what she said and how it differed. So what Ellen White said was exactly uh, matching what the Bible said. But she did add some things, and um, I, I wanted to conclude sort of with some contrasts between um, Ellen White and St. Thomas Aquinas, um, which is, um, uh, like the Bible, Ellen White was uh, emphasizing the individual acts of charity as being important, um, and also addressing uh, systematic change as a root of cause of poverty and inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, let's see. Uh, well, an another thought that came to me was that had, had God wished to, to do so, he could have uh, provided enough means to eliminate poverty altogether. He, he, he has the means to do that. But I think what he's also aiming at is a develop, development of character in us so that the reason they're still poor besides the poor's bad choices is also to test um, how we would respond to the poor. And I, I was thinking of the story of the Good Samaritan, which essentially differentiated between people who truly applied what God said and believed it versus like the Pharisee and, or the, the, the Levite and the priest who, who merely gave it lip service, but they, they let the poor guy um, stay there. So I, I will end with a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, which says, there is nothing uh, after the recognition of the claims of God that more distinguishes the laws given by Moses than the liberal, tender, and hospitable spirit enjoined towards the poor. Although God had promised greatly to bless his people, it was not his design that poverty should be wholly unknown among them. He declared that the poor should never cease out of the land. They would uh, ever be those who among, among his people who would call into exercise their sympathy, tenderness, and benevolence. Then, as now, persons were subject to misfortune, sickness, and loss of property. Yet so long as they followed the instruction given by God, there were no beggars among them, neither any who suffered for food. So yep. with that, we'll conclude. Thank you, Doc. And it, it, is, it, is just, it is just incredible that poverty is the, the result of a decision to, to, to exalt self. It's sin, exalt self and deviate from a relationship with God. It's that simple. Hmm. And how God comes to the world and really shows us how his incredible love affects positively poverty and sickness and, and every one of the woes that we experience as human beings. It's just incredible. Thank you. Thanks. We are going to begin to look at um, a, a couple of characters here. We're going to look at the rich young ruler, we're going to certainly look at Job. We're going to look at Zacchaeus.
And uh, this is an incredible part of the lesson that I hope we, we, will, um, um, we will derive a great, um, uh, great understanding of um, what is required of us. Uh, Tuesday's lesson talks about the rich young ruler. So what, what, who's the rich young ruler? What do we know about the rich, the rich young ruler? Scripture does not tell us much about the rich young ruler other than that he was young, that he was a ruler, and that he was rich. However, the story is so important that it is recorded for us. It is recorded to us in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. All three Gospels tells us that this rich young ruler had an interest in spiritual things. Matthew tells us that... Um, the rich young ruler saw Christ's love manifested towards the children that were brought to Christ. And he saw how tenderly Christ received them. We know that he fell in love with Jesus, that he felt a desire to be Christ's disciple. And we also know that he was excited to learn about eternal life. And so, the rich young ruler approaches Jesus and asks him, as we read in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16, good teacher, that's how he approaches DJ, uh, 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 Jesus, good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's an incredible question. It's a great question that we should all be asking the Lord on a regular basis. Here's Jesus' reply and, of course, a subsequent dialogue that takes place between Jesus and the rich young ruler. And we're going to read Matthew 19, verses 17 to 21. Verses 17 to 21. Here's what Scripture tells us. So Jesus said to him, and we're talking about, I'm talking about the rich young ruler, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. This is verse 17. So here Jesus is beginning to say, is it life that you seek? If, if life is what you seek, keep the commandments. Verse 18. The rich young ruler said to Jesus, which ones? Now pay attention what Jesus does as he answers the question. Which ones, which of the commandments? And Jesus said, you shall not murder you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not um, uh, bear false witness, verse 19, you, should, you, you, you need to honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments that Jesus mentions have to do with a relationship with my fellow man. Pay special attention to that. Now, let's read verse 20. So the young man said to Jesus, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? He asked. Verse 21. Then Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then, come, follow me. Incredible passage of Scripture. The rich young ruler's reply to God, as we just read in Matthew 19, 20, all these things I have kept from my youth, gives you and I a great understanding that he had a high esteem of his own righteousness. And that he did not think that he was defective in anything. And yet he felt the want of something he did not have. That's why he approached Jesus. What can I do to have eternal life? That is why he asked, what do I still lack? Jesus loved this young man. He so much wanted to give him the peace and grace and joy which would significantly change his character. That is why Jesus tells him, as we read in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, in other words, if you want life, 
If life is your choice, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And then once you've done that, come follow me. Christ longed to create in this rich young man the discernment which would enable him to see the necessity of art devotion to God and Christian goodness to his fellow man. And this is really what Jesus says. If you want to be, if you want to be saved, love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. That's really. Jesus saw in this rich young ruler just the help he needed. If he only would become a co-laborer with Christ in the world, uh, in, the, in the work of salvation. Christ read the young man's heart. There was only one thing he lacked. But that one thing was a vital principle. He needed the love of God in the soul. His supreme love of self needed to be totally surrendered. You can only serve one master. Christ gave the rich young ruler a test and a choice. He called upon him to choose between the heavenly treasure and worldly greatness. The heavenly treasure would be his if he would follow Christ. In order for this to be accomplished, he would have to submit his will into Christ's total control. Christ offered, offered this young ruler the opportunity of becoming a son of God and a co heir with Christ to the heavenly treasure. All the young ruler needed to do was to take up the cross and follow the Savior in the path of self-denial. There are, these are Christ's conditions and terms for any one of us aspiring to be sons and daughters of God and co-heirs with Christ for an eternity. You see, here is the rule of conduct for anyone wanting to be Christ's disciple. Nothing short of obedience and commitment to Christ can be accepted. Self-surrender, self which is the substance of the teachings of Christ, is necessary. Matthew 19, 20, that when the rich young ruler heard Jesus tell him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor, that he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. In so, do, in so doing, and I want you to pay attention to this, the rich young ruler refused the offer of eternal life. Ellen G. White, in Desire of Ages, page 53, provides the following comment. Um, not only end with this, but end with a verse. The ruler's possessions were entrusted to him that he might prove himself a faithful steward. That is your situation. And that's my situation. He was to dispense these goods for the blessings of those in need, she says. So God now entrusts men and women with means, with talents, and with opportunities that they may be his agents in helping the poor and the suffering. He who uses these entrusted gifts as God designs becomes a co-worker with the, with the Savior. And then she goes on to say, he wins souls to Christ because he is a representative of his character. You see, when Christ's followers surrender their will to the Lord and are obedient to him and give back to the Lord that which is his, the time, the money, the talent, and the position that God gives us, they are accumulating treasures which will be given to them when they hear Christ say at his second coming, Matthew 25, 23, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Uh, can I make a quick comment on sure. this? I, something came to mind as you were speaking. One notable thing was that he, that is the rich young ruler, is not named. So could it be that Christ wanted you to put your own name in there? Uh, as as the rich young ruler, and in fact, it seemed like there was some parallel between Absolutely. the Church of Laodicea and the rich young ruler, because it says uh, this is from Revelation three, uh, 
verse uh, 17, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, blind, and naked. Yep. I counsel you to buy gold and refined in fire. So yep. I, I, I thought of that parallel Absolutely. as you were talking. Very much so. Very much so. Anyway, I, know, I don't want very to take much too much so. time. No, that's very true. Danielle, talk to us about Zacchaeus and his conversion and how Be significant Before that is. I go into Zacchaeus, I had thoughts on your presentation too. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I just thought as he, as we were reading and, and, and as the Lord did the invitation to him, the disciples made those decisions. The disciples had given everything to follow the, uh, Jesus. They've left profitable businesses and things behind, families, right. and they followed. Would this man have been another Peter? Would he have been another John, Correct. the revelator? Would he have been a Paul of, of the wrote the Romans to us? We never know. Exactly. He was obviously educated, and educated in that society meant in the Bible, in the Torah, in the beliefs. And he obviously had a spiritual interest in Jesus, but yet, at the end of the day, he rejected. Right. We never know what he could have become. Right. Good point. Very good point. Wes, we're looking at Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, I mean, there's a huge contrast between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler. I mean, the rich young ruler, he was looked up by society. He was praised by society. He was a ruler. He was wealthy. He was studied. He was a pillar in the society, one in becoming. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, he was the tax collector who everybody loved to hate. Yeah, he was despised. Despised. Because he was bowing down to the Romans and profiting from his own brothers and sisters, so to speak, which were Hebrew like him. So let's read his story. Let's go straight into it and look chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And here we see Jesus is needing to go through uh, Jericho, that's where Zacchaeus lived, Jericho, the famous Jericho. And as he's passing by, we, we know that Zacchaeus must have heard about him because he was looking. He had heard that Jesus was coming and he was looking for Jesus. So here goes, verse 19, uh, verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. He wasn't just a tax collector, he was over all the tax collectors in the area. And he was rich. I mean, he may have been just as rich as the rich young ruler, or maybe richer. We don't know. And he sought to see who Jesus was. He had an interest. He was drawn to Jesus. But could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. I mean, that's not very um, dignified. He, he really didn't care. He really was wanting to see Jesus. For he was going to pass that way. Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, I think I would have fallen out of the tree if that happened to me. Like, <laughs> but he didn't fall. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I mean, I can see Zacchaeus so anxious to meet him and to see him, just to see him. And here comes Zacchaeus, stops under the tree, looks up at him, calls him by name and says, I'm going to come to your house. <laughs> Heart attack time. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. We can see the despise that he, he, that he received from his fellow Israelites. And for good reason. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. Did the Lord ask him? Like the rich young ruler? No. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, had he? Yeah, he had. I restore fourfold. So it wasn't an empty promise. He was going to bring, pay back four times the amount. I can see the people lined up. Okay, he took so much from me extra. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I mean big difference in attitudes between the rich young man who was a pillar of the society, uh, looked up, trained in the biblical, but all Jews were 
trained in the biblical aspects they were taught in their households as they raised, were raised up. But from Zacchaeus' perspective, a hopeless sinner, cursed even though he was wealthy, he demonstrated exactly his heart for the Lord. Amen. And that's the, I mean, the, the, Jesus could have said to him, okay, no, no, Zacchaeus, that's not enough. But Jesus never said that's not enough because Jesus was evaluating the rich young man's uh, heart and he was evaluating Zacchaeus' heart. And Zacchaeus' heart was all for the Lord. And it, it, Jesus never asked him to do anything. He offered to do all of that and the Lord could read his heart. Uh, Zacchaeus is the one who speaks first about giving money to the poor. But to the young ruler, Jesus had to tell him. Uh, Zacchaeus needed to be careful about the dangers of his wealth. Uh, but his conversion was on the spot and full-fledged. It's just so beautiful. It just comes vivid and alive. It's the same invitation to us as uh, the Zacchaeus was not spelled out by Jesus. But Jesus, obviously Zacchaeus had a utter commitment to whatever the Lord was going to do in his life, uh, no matter what it took. You know, the care for the poor is a divine commandment. Correct. And that's very clear when we look in Deuteronomy 15.7. And we've studied Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is what? Deuteronomy is the farewell letter of Moses to the Israelites before they're going to enter Canaan, before he was going to die. And he is reminding them of all the commandments both the Ten Commandments, but also the, all the other commandments in the, that they had received from the Lord. And here it goes, Deuteronomy 15, 7. If there is among you a poor man or your brother within any of the gates in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. It's not like you're going to think about it. It's a command. And we see another thing in, in the Deuteronomy, which... Mm, you know, I've, we've read Deuteronomy, but I've never paid full attention to this text. And it's basically telling them to do for the poor, to set aside every three years a second tithe. So you do the 10% to the Levites to support the church work, but then every three years, so not every year, but every three years, to set aside an additional tenth in order to care for the poor. So here it goes. There, it's in Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 to 29. And it says, at the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gate. So every three years, you'll do your tithe of everything like you do. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. We know that for the Levites, they had to do ongoing, continuous. But the third one was for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates may come to eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. And in case we were wondering, it's repeated in Deuteronomy 26, 12, 13. So we didn't misunderstand. We didn't mishear. Here it goes again. When you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithes from my house and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments, commandments, which you have commanded me and have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I mean, very powerful. Uh, I'd like to wrap up with a few words from Matt, Mark 10, 24, where it says, and the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in the riches to enter the kingdom of God? So if our, like the rich and ruler, if we choose to believe in our wealth, we will never enter the kingdom of God. And in Luke 18, 27, but he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. In other words, it may be impossible for me to change myself, but the Lord can change me. Thanks so much, Danielle.
its two personalities is, is significant. He is the rich young ruler that uh, departs in sorrow. Mm. And here's Zacchaeus joyful. in the tree so joyfully saying to Christ, come and sup with me. Tremendous, tremendous contrast. Doctor, talk about Job. How does God describe Job? That's a very good question at the core of, um, I think at the core of this lesson. So uh, Job is described by God himself as perfect and upright. So perfect and upright that no one else on earth at that time could equal him. Again, these are God's own verbatim words about Job. So I think it's important to study the characteristics of this man whom God called perfect. Um, and, and so let, let's look at those verses. So in Job 1.8, it says, uh, this is God talking, the Lord is talking to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So I, I think uh, of myself, what, what would God, how would God describe me if he was talking? Um, so I, I think this would be a, a very good way uh, if God himself can refer to you as perfect and blameless and upright. Um, and then in Job 29, 12 to 16, um, he, that is, uh, the book of Job actually gives the characteristics of what God appreciated about him. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing uh, of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Uh, and, and, and I thought that was interesting, that he, he actually caused somebody to sing for joy. So he, his, his good deeds had a, had a positive effect on everyone around him. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Uh, my justice was like the robe, a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. So unlike the example of the unrighteous ruler in Christ's parable who uh, the widow had to pester him repeatedly and he said, though I fear not God and regard not man, so, but she wearies me, so I'm going to give her justice. Um, the, this was the exact opposite of what Job did. So Job would actually seek out the poor before they even came to him. So, so not only did he help the poor, but he actually was proactive in searching them. And, and I think that was an, actually noted in the lesson itself. It says, one of the most insightful uh, words... Perhaps what's most insightful here are Job's words, and I searched out the case that I did not know. In other words, Job didn't simply wait, for instance, for some beggar in rags to approach him for a handout. Instead, Job was proactive in seeking them out and acting on what they do. And then he has a quote from Ellen White here, too. It says, Do not wait for them, that is, the poor, to call your attention to their needs. Act as did Job. The thing that he knew he uh, he knew not, he searched out. Go on inspect, uh, inspecting tour and learn what is needed and how it is best to be supplied. Um, this is a, levy, a level of money management and stewardship that God's resources that is beyond the practice of many of God's children today. And I was also thinking of Nehemiah when he went and inspected the city by night before he would go and tell the people what was needed is he he did a, a pre-inspection so likewise Job would be proactive in looking for the poor so I feel like that's the next level in charity when you're actually looking for people to benefit um, and then there was a good quote here in the lesson from Isaiah um, Isaiah 58 uh, verses 6 through 8 is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke. Uh, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, uh, 
and that you bring uh, to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and hide not from your own flesh, that your light shall break forth like the morning and your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. The book of Job seems well suited or at least to consider uh, many of the objections. Um, oh, also, now I'm, I was moving to a little bit different point. So the, uh, the book of Job also seems suitable to the objections of many of the atheists or non-believers against the existence of a sovereign or personal God. Um, and so some of the ideas that I got from the book of Job, this is just more in general, is the idea of what to do about the problem of suffering. So in, in, in this book, Job didn't do anything wrong. He, it's not like Job was a righteous man and then he did this horrible thing like David when he numbered the people, God punished him specifically for that and he knew it. Uh, but Job didn't do anything wrong. So th this book specifically addresses that theme because I feel like that's frequently brought up as a reason why people don't want to believe in God. If God's all-powerful and all-knowing uh, and all-wealthy, why would there be suffering in the world? Why do innocent people suffer? And so he, he, he gives an answer here. And then it also talks about the nature of faith. Throughout the book, Job remains steadfast in his faith, even when he doesn't understand what God is doing or why he is allowing him to suffer. This is demonstrating the importance of trusting God and holding on to one's faith, even in the midst of trials and hardships. And then it also talks about the limitations of human wisdom. That is, Job's friends to come to comfort him to a, and attempt to explain his suffering through various theories, such as uh, that he must have sinned or that God is punishing him for his own good. However, their explanations are ultimately shown to be inadequate and Job himself comes to realize that the ways of God are beyond human understanding. And then it talks also about the sovereignty of God. So the book of jo Job affirms that God is in control of all things, including suffering and hardship, and that all his ways are higher than our ways. This can be difficult to accept, but ultimately calls us to trust in God's goodness and wisdom. And then it also talks finally about the importance of humility. Uh, Job's encounters with God at the end of the book humble him and remind him of his place in the universe. This underscores the importance of recognizing our own limitations and depending on God for strength and wisdom. So the book of Job challenges readers to think deeply about some of life's most difficult questions and to trust in God's goodness and sovereignty, even in the midst of suffering and hardship. Mm -hmm. And then um, one more thing I say before I leave the book of Job that actually uh, I, I hadn't noticed until I read the introduction to the book of Job from this is the remnant study with Ellen G. White comments. But it says... Uh, the the word Job means persecuted one in Hebrew and in Arabic it means to come back or repent. So I was like, this is maybe a fitting way to end, to think that though we might be persecuted in the future as Job was in the past, uh, in the end if we come back to God we're going to have a brighter end than uh, our beginnings. So we'll end with that. Amen. Thanks so much, Doc. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a few. Um, um, to wrap up, just some of my thoughts on my two studies that I've covered. Uh, I really, really, really dawned on me very powerfully the fact that Jesus used as his first words to pronounce his ministry here on earth is that of ministering to the people in need. It, it just uh, somehow, even though I've read the Bible all this time, it really need, didn't come full, full and center to me that those were his first announcement to the world as to his ministry, his job here on earth. And as a practical way, sometimes I think, okay, what does it mean to, to, to be like him? I mean, the, the only way we can become like him is through our relationship and through beholding and falling in love with him.
and then to really ask him for help to become like him. In a practical way, he sent the Holy Spirit, and he does inspire us when there is someone in need on what to do. And it's, as long as we listen to the Holy Spirit bidding, that's going to grow in us. But it it's, means us practically saying yes to at the times when God, through the Holy Spirit, inspires us to move forward on helping someone. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. It was wonderful. Thank you. I just want to just do a little revision from the A Scriptures perspective of this lesson. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. God sent his son, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ to the sinful world to save. And to save without any discrimination of any kind. What an amazing God we've got. Jesus is the ultimate example of a kingsman redeemer, our close relative, who came to rescue us, rescue us from the wretchedness of this world because of sin, from suffering, and from eternal destruction. That is imperative that we will always, always remember this. His examples should be the standard for our human relationships, especially in the church and in connection with the poor and those who suffer. The Sabbath school lesson addressed that. Therefore, just like Jesus did, we should not deny help to any person, but offer what we can, including food and water, even to our enemies, as the wise man counsels us to do in Proverbs. Read it with me. Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. Here is what it says. Verse 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Verse 22. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. You know what that Bible is really saying? What that chapter, I mean, what that verse is really telling, telling us is when you do this to an enemy, the heap coals of fire are really fires of repentance and sorrow that will burn up the heel will that the enemy has. Powerful stuff. To care for the poor is a hallmark of God's righteousness in the light of the Christian. We need to be more than just religious. You, you heard Danielle reading James 1.7. Poor and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That is part of a relationship and a commitment to be, to be Christ. As we saw in this week's Sabbath school lesson, Job, the rich young ruler, and Zacchaeus were rich and religious. I hope that you understand that our spiritual lives must not be defined by the blessings of riches, or by a pretense of religion, but by a genuine response to the divine command to help the poor and the unfortunate, as we read in James chapter 1, verses 27. Job understood that charity was God's righteousness in his life. And I really appreciate your explanation of Job. The conversion of Zacchaeus became evident when he returned all that he had taken and when he gave half of his possession to the poor, as you explained. For the rich young ruler, giving all to the poor was his opportunity to become a disciple of the king of kings. And yet, unfortunately, this young man valued his worldly possessions more than the one who gave him the power to acquire the wealth he had. Ellen G. White tells us in Desire of Ages, pages 639, as you open your door to Christ's needy and suffering ones, you are welcoming 
unseen angels, she says. She goes on to say, you invite the companions of heavenly beings. They bring a sacred atmosphere of joy and peace. They come with praise upon their lips. And an answering strain is heard in heaven when a poor praises you for what you do through your heart. And then she says, every deed of mercy makes music in heaven. The Father from his throne numbers the unselfish workers among his most precious treasures. I hope that you and I make a decision to be seen by heaven and the Father as unselfish workers, being among his most precious treasures. Let's ask the Lord to bless us. Let's pray. I invite you to bow your heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. While on this earth, O oh Lord, you provided a tremendous example of what it is like to love God unconditionally. Lord, you have reminded us in Scripture that our salvation is a response to the condition of our heart. How we love you. And you have asked us, Lord, to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I'm so glad, Lord, that in Scripture we have Job and we have Zacchaeus. We have the disciples. We have a lot of, a lot of those that have gone before us as an example of their, of their relationship with you and the condition of their heart. Lord, we wouldn't, we don't, we don't want to be like the rich young ruler. So help us, Father, to understand that we are stewards of the gifts you provided. The time, the talent, the money, and the possessions. May we use them the way you want them. You, you want us to use them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.